It takes more than just a few weeks to establish a self-sufficient property. In fact, we've been working on ours since 2006 and it still isn't finished. It never will be. But there are things you can do from scratch to quickly get your property pumping out food in hardly any time at all. G'day, I'm Mark from Self Sufficient Me and in this video, I'm gonna give you five ways to quickly become more self-sufficient. Let's get into it. Number one, fast growing vegetables. Now I'm stealing this from one of my recent videos. Eight fast growing vegetables where I detail some of the fastest growing veg you can grow in a hurry. But what I didn't emphasize in that video was how versatile and adaptive many of these fast growing crops are. Because what if you don't have a bunch of raised garden beds or even a vegetable plot with established furrows in ground. Yes, it's not hard to dig a patch of ground, but there are even faster ways to get growing vegetables, such as in containers or pots, or any type of vessel you have hanging around that will hold a growing mix. Most vegetables only need about 20 to 30 centimeters of medium or soil to grow in. And that means things like plastic bags can be used or repurposed as a cheap alternative to containers. And the beauty of growing in containers or bags is the portability. You can pretty much create a growing area anywhere that gets sun. And even if you're in a place that doesn't get sun and you have to grow indoors, you could use grow lights. Of course, if you do have plenty of backyard space, then I would encourage you to use it. Get rid of that grass and transform it into a food growing factory. Number two is poultry. Chickens, ducks, there are a couple around, quail, geese, turkeys, etc. All these types of birds are fantastic to have and fast to grow. Here you go. Enjoy your new home. That's it. They're going to be loving it here, especially out of their brooder box now. This is going to seem like huge to them. So good on them. Poultry are cost effective. They're easy to breed. They're easy to look after. And as you can see, they don't take up much space at all. And that's just some of the reasons why we have stuck with poultry rather than larger animals. See, livestock, for me anyway, and depending on where you live, for most people, there's too many rules and regulations. Love that locking system. Yeah, the rules and regulations, for example, pigs. We can't keep pigs here on a three acre property. You can only in our jurisdiction if you have an acreage of 40 or over to keep pigs. So that's just one example. And it's not just that. The rules for livestock are different to poultry. Poultry have very little rules and regulations. Yes, there are numbers that loosely you have to stick to. For example, we're not allowed to keep more than 30 chickens, 20 ducks. There isn't any limitations on quail whatsoever. I'm not sure if the regulations haven't caught up to quail keeping at the moment or why that is. But I'm not saying steer away from steers and cows and even horses and other types of animals that you'd love to keep on a small acreage. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is if you want to get self-sufficient in things like eggs and meat really quickly, well then keeping poultry is definitely the fastest way to go about it. For example, these quail here, they hatched out in 18 days from eggs. They become adults in six weeks. They start laying eggs around six to seven, maybe up to eight weeks, which is only just a couple of months. And then from there, they're edible. If you want a meat bird, like quail, is primarily kept for their meat, not the eggs, but of course the eggs are nice too, especially in Asian food. 
they are ready to go on the dinner plate in around nine weeks, which is extremely fast. And the fact that they lay so quickly and become an adult so fast, you can just keep replicating and breeding up your stock faster than ducks even. And you can hear how excited those ducks are about that. Chickens are a bit different. We don't usually keep our chickens for food. We don't even have a rooster. And speaking of regulations, that is one regulation we have here in our area and that you have to have a permit even for our property, three acres, you still have to have a permit to keep a rooster, which is a little weird. But we don't have a rooster anyway because we keep chickens primarily for eggs. But we can always upscale that if we want to. And if you want to keep chickens for the eggs, which I highly recommend, you just buy them at point of lay what about 16 to 20 dollars a chook which is you know only about double what you would probably buy for a frozen one or one at the supermarket anyway i mean it's incredible really isn't it and you can buy them at point of lay get them home so they're already a few months old and they will start laying for you in a few weeks after that and if there's no way you can say get out in a crisis and you have to live off chicken eggs well you can do that because that is your source of protein. You might get sick of eating eggs, but it's better than starving, or it's better than having veg all the time and no extra protein. Number three is do it yourself, DIY. Often people don't get started in self-sufficiency because they fear having to build things like this, a quail pen or a chicken pen or a chicken coop. I have a green thumb, I'll acknowledge that, I'm pretty good at it, but I'm not a carpenter's bum bag. Honestly, I really find it a struggle to build any type of structure. Regardless, I've still somehow managed to build chicken and quail runs, sheds, garden beds, and lots more. I don't strive for perfection. I think a lot of you know that if you've followed me for some time, but that's exactly why I show you all these things. I don't show you them because I think I'm this shit-hot carpenter. I don't, and I'm not. I just show you them because if I could do it, so can you, and I hope that motivates people. Now, I've lifted plenty of hammers, and I'm handy enough. I mean, I've set up a lot of barbed wire as a soldier, and uh, so I've got a bit of jack of all trades in me, but I think the majority of people out there underestimate their skills. They could easily do these projects without much help at all from books, YouTube or carpentry, just by going what's logical and set, just getting wood hammered together to make a structure that may be over-engineered in some cases or maybe not, maybe you have some failures. But at the end of the day, if the thing doesn't work or if it falls down, it's not your house falling down on your kids or whatever, it's just a chicken coop with a hole in it or that hasn't stood up to the elements or whatever. Keep going, keep refining things. I do this all the time. There's no shame in being a bodgy builder. I use bits and pieces from everywhere. I repurpose things. And just the sheer fact that I repurpose things to make these structures makes them look a bit bodgy because they're secondhand materials. They often don't go together very well. So yeah, who cares if it looks a little bit shoddy? If it works and does the job, that's all you should care about. You might find you don't need anything from the store or the hardware store to start your projects and to get things running. Number four is make your own carbs. Instead of playing Corona Roulette and going to the store to get fresh bread daily, we're making our own. And fresh homemade pasta always beats the dried store stuff anyway. So with this extended isolation break, we're all forced to take, why not make your own? Carbs are a good source of food. They're packed full of calories. I eat way too many, but it's that high calorie density that makes foods like rice, wheat, and potatoes such important food crops around the world. The problem is growing your own wheat or rice in a backyard and then refining it into a food that we can use isn't practical for most people anyway and whilst growing potatoes is they take several months to grow 
They take up more storage space and don't last as long as rice or flour. Corn is an easier grain to grow for a backyarder and you can easily make your own cornmeal to store and use like flour and rice. However, corn still takes a few months to grow. Therefore, whilst you're waiting for those spuds and corn crops to harvest, I recommend getting some flour and rice for their excellent storage and consumption qualities for the many different high density carbs you can make with these products. Number five is preserving. Now, you can see this corn crop has had it, but this is an old style of corn. It's an Aztec type. And if I can just get this husk off quick enough so that you don't get bored, um, you'll see that it'll reveal these wonderful kernels underneath. And we're not growing them to eat off the cob like that. We're growing these, like it's, like it's wrapped so much, isn't it? We're growing these in, here, it, here we go. Isn't that gorgeous? We're growing these so that we can make cornmeal out of it, like I was talking about before. But the way you can preserve it, you can even preserve it in the husk like that and just hang them. I've seen them hung in Asia underneath huts in the husk, or sometimes not. And then they just dry out and they go really hard. And then you can then meal them up or is that grind them up into a meal, not make a meal into a, like a flour. If you've got a, a milling machine, you can get them into a really fine flour. Otherwise you can use a coffee grinder or something like that and still turn it into something you can make tortillas or something out of. In our modern day buy on demand, consume and throw away world, we've become accustomed to minimalized living, getting what we want when we want it from someone else instead of preserving and storing surplus to use when we need it. I think that old way of lifestyle has now changed considerably for all of us. The first and easiest way to preserve is to freeze, and most of us do that. Pack your freezers full of things and then you'll become more self-sufficient, or at least have food spare if you can't go out and get some. Pickling in vinegar, that is another very easy way to preserve food, and it's also an extremely tasty way. I love my pickles. Fermenting, making sauerkraut, that's another one of my favorites. It's a bit like pickling, but it's more, uh, it's not, it's still natural, like using vinegar is natural, but fermenting and getting that sour taste, the lactobacilli bacteria is, is probably a, a better for you type of preserving. But you know, that's up for debate. It's whatever is a very good way to preserve food and to make tasty food as well. Dehydrating. That again, just by simply sucking out all the water and moisture from foods and then rehydrating them or eating them dehydrated is a perfect way to save food for the long term. Salting food like making jerky or personally I like biltong, that South African dried meat. And there's many other ways to preserve food. I hope you enjoyed this video, whether you're forced sort of into self-sufficiency or it's something now that has jolted you into it because of the current things that we're all going through it doesn't matter you're in the self-sufficiency club now and just because you haven't started yet it's not too late get stuck into it i encourage you to you will find out how easy it is i've been preaching how easy it is for such a long time because i know my failings and like I keep saying, if I can do it, anyone can. And there is just so many benefits, not just to get us through these times, but after that, force yourself to get into these types of habits. And then once this is all over, you will just be doing it because you love it. And it's just a good, healthy and better alternate way of doing things. Anyway. Thanks a lot for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already. Give me a big, self-sufficient, fast thumbs up. Bye for now.